This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show looking at a new book detailing how hundreds of thousands of people died from COVID due to decisions of politicians like Mitch McConnell, pharmaceutical conglomerates and a cabal of billionaires who exploited the pandemic for political advantage and personal enrichment. The book is titled Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers, Accountability for Those Who Caused the Crisis, by the nation's John Nichols. He's joining us now for more. John, welcome back to Democracy Now! Um, congratulations on the book that's coming out this month. Um, you just listened to Professor Menchik talking about how he's gathering together other, as he calls them, guinea pigs, you know, human guinea pigs, who um, deeply believe that we had to come up with vaccines and so put their own bodies on the line, but are now seeing that they feel that their bodies were on the line for the profits of the pharmaceutical companies. Can you put this into a larger context? I'm afraid I can. And first off, thanks for having me, Amy, and thanks for having me as part of this segment in particular, because I think the professor uh, highlighted so much of what is at stake and, and also what's been happening. Uh, what I try to detail in the book and what I've written about a lot over the last two years uh, is a painful reality. At the start of the pandemic, back in January and February of 2020, we knew about the shock doctrine. We knew about uh, disaster capitalism. We had learned all of this from uh, Naomi Klein and others. We had a clear picture of it. And yet, as this pandemic played out, we saw all of the worst aspects of disaster capitalism come into play. We saw, first and foremost, corporations and individuals who sought to advance themselves economically and in their share of markets. Uh, by cashing in on the fear, the, the concern, the crisis itself. We also saw politicians who aided and abetted this process at virtually every turn. The end result is that there is simply no question that hundreds of thousands of people who died in the United States did not have to die. Uh, the Lancet study uh, from around a year ago suggests that roughly 40 percent of deaths in the, in the first year of the pandemic were unnecessary. Uh, Dr. Deborah Birx, who was the White House, uh, you know, kind of lead on this issue, has suggested that after the first 100,000 deaths, uh, the deaths that came, you know, in later in 2020, in 2021 and beyond, uh, were exponentially larger or higher than needed. And so we have this core reality that in the United States alone. Hundreds of thousands of deaths occurred that did not have to occur. Globally, it's in the millions. And the U.S. could have played a huge role so, in addressing so, that. So if you could name names, again, we're speaking with John Nichols of The Nation, and his book is coming out now. Uh, that's called Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers. Um, in February 2021, uh, Pfizer— uh, announced, you write in your book, the company announced it expected to take in $15 billion from vaccine sales during the course of the year, the COVID-19 vaccine now accounting for nearly a quarter of Pfizer's profits. That's right. And in fact, uh, at the, the end of the year, it turned out to be much more with Pfizer, Moderna and other companies. Uh, the People's Vaccine Project has estimated that uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and BioNTech are taking in $1,000 a second, uh, $65,000 a minute in profits from these vaccines. So uh, it's, it's just almost uh, jaw-dropping, the amount of money that they're taking in. This has been a, a huge benefit to these companies. These vaccines, which were developed with tremendous amounts of assistance from the U.S. government and from multinational, multilateral groupings uh, have turned out to be their, their leaders in their profits. They are making, you know, overwhelming amounts of money as a result of this. And yet, at the same time, they are refusing uh, to make their, their vaccine strategies and approaches available uh, through to other countries. They're also uh, seeking at every turn to maximize their profits in the United States. And the painful reality here is that there's very little accountability. There's very little efforts by Congress and by watchdogs uh, outside. There are watchdog groups that have done tremendous work, but by 
federal and state watchdogs that should be involved here uh, to hold these companies to account and to force them to, A, make their, their vaccines more available, and B, to uh, recognize that these excess profits uh, go way beyond the bounds. I mean, you have, for example, um, uh, Oxfam uh, saying in 2021, May 2021, so it's beyond that now, COVID vaccines create nine new billionaires with combined wealth greater than the cost of vaccinating the world's poorest countries. Um, John Nichols, President Biden could force this with Moderna because the U.S. taxpayer money was used to develop the vaccine. That's exactly right. And and in fact, uh, President Biden has certainly done a better job than Donald Trump. There's no question of that. But he has not begun uh, to go to the, the levels that he should, and nor has Congress, on, on forcing these companies, which took tremendous uh, advantage of the moment and which, frankly, got tremendous amounts of support from the U.S. government, literally uh, numbering in the, in the tens of billions of dollars in support and contracts. Uh, to show some sort of responsibility. This is not a new concept. In the past, we have had pharmaceutical companies that, that bent to the reality, uh, either by, by pressure from government or, or simply some sort of moral uh, instinct, that, that they cannot take these sorts of excess profits in a moment like this. And, and you did mention also a moment ago billionaires. And it's important to understand that, you know, thanks to the work of the Institute for Policy Studies and Americans for Tax Fairness and others, we, we now know that uh, during the course of this pandemic, billionaires have exponentially increased their wealth. And some of these are, are folks associated with the pharmaceutical industry, but across all industries, to the point where you know, the number of billionaires increased from, and this is a study from last year, from 614 in the United States to 745 and that their, their increase in wealth during the course of the year uh, you know, took them you know, literally into the trillions of dollars of, of advanced uh, wealth for these individuals. And again, we just have not had an accountability moment. John, we were just showing images. We're showing images of Jeff Bezos. What, what, how does he profit? Oh, uh, Jeff Bezos, who gets a chapter in the book, and, and the book features uh, 18 uh, chapters, short essays, on uh, examples of where people took advantage of or played politics with this crisis uh, and have not been held to account for that, although perhaps we could say Donald Trump was by his defeat in 2020. But I look at all these individuals, and Bezos is one of them. You know, for Bezos, uh, you've actually highlighted some of the, the ways in which Bezos took advantage of this. Uh, there were, early on in the pandemic, individuals who worked in Amazon warehouses who said, look, this is a problem. We have people who are getting sick. We have people whose lives are being put uh, at risk, and there need to be much greater protections. And as you know, some of those individuals were fired for simply for raising the alarm. Uh, at the same time, there have been unions that have sought to increase protections in Amazon warehouses. Amazon has fought at every turn to present, prevent those unions from uh, coming into and organizing at those warehouses. At the same time, Jeff Bezos's wealth has extended to such an extent that there is now open speculation that he may be the first trillionaire in the United States or in the world. Uh, and beyond that, he's shooting himself up into space, you know, on, on you know personal adventures at a time when frontline workers are still uh, getting sick, dying, and suffering uh, as a result of the challenges posed by this pandemic. Can you tell us the story of Michael Jackson, where you begin your book, uh, who is in your home state of Wisconsin? Sure. In each of the chapters in the book, I try to look at individuals who got sick or died uh, and to try and explore the, all the politics and the profiteering that uh, went on that might have actually prevented those deaths or at least uh, made things better. And uh, Mike Jackson was a worker at a Briggs & Stratton plant in the Milwaukee area. Uh, where they made uh, lawn care products. And he was, he was deemed an essential worker, because I guess lawn care was, was essential, um, and uh, went to his plant uh, on a regular basis. He had a large family, which he was working hard to support. And uh, he got sick. 
And instead of uh, uh, you know having the protections that were needed, first off, before he got, got sick, I should emphasize that he and others had raised the alarm. And in so many cases, there are frontline workers and workers in vulnerable situations who raised the alarm through their unions or individually, uh, and he wasn't paid attention to. And then when he did get sick, uh, he was escorted out of the, the plant at one point, but then was back in a, in a couple of days working again. He finally collapsed at his machine, and he ended up uh, dying a, a few days later. His death was, uh, you know, one of many in that that kind of in those initial stages of the pandemic. Uh, what happened in Milwaukee, though, and what was really encouraging, is that grassroots groups uh, took the example of that death and really highlighted it and made it a part of a, a movement, a, a call for workplaces to do much more to protect workers, and frankly, for government to intervene. And if I can just emphasize at this point, there were a lot of protections that went in, uh, emergency protections that went in for uh, frontline workers and workers in manufacturing and other settings. Many of those protections now have fallen away. And so in many cases, we have workers today uh, who don't have the protections that they had in early stages of the pandemic. What we need desperately is an accountability moment where we recognize that people like Mike Jackson probably didn't have to die and that their deaths should not be in vain. You, we should have permanent protections for workers. John Nichols, very quickly, why did you devote a whole chapter to Jared Kushner, President Trump's son-in-law? Because he did an incredibly lousy job on uh, running the, the supply chain. And there was a critical moment in which it was clear we didn't have the supplies that we needed. Uh, and there were ways in which to get those supplies, to do domestic manufacturing, to do you know, good deals for importation. Instead, Jared Kushner was put in charge of it. It was such a disaster that even back in 2020, you know, just months into his oversight of these supply chain issues, uh, he was under investigation by Congress. They finally folded the program he was involved in because, like just about everything else Jared Kushner touched during the Trump administration, this thing fell apart. You know, I'm wondering how you respond, and we just have a minute, to uh, arguments that, oh, well, you're just really an anti-vaxxer, even the same with uh, Professor Menchik, attacking him as that. How you can yeah. be pro-vaccine uh, but anti-profiteering? I thank God for the vaccines. I am uh, double vaccinated and boosted, and if there's another booster coming, I'm going to be first in line to get it. I think these are incredibly vital to saving people's lives uh, at this point and going forward. And the fact of the matter is, I want these vaccines to be available to everyone, not uh, blocked via profiteering and failed government policies. I want them available to everyone uh, in the United States and around the world. And I know from doing this book that that is possible. John Nichols, want to thank you for being with us, the nation's national affairs correspondent. His new book, coming out later this month, Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers, Accountability for Those Who Cause the Crisis. Democracy Now! is currently accepting applications for Human Resources Manager. You can learn more and apply at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Fels, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Marati Osana, Tammy Warrenoff, Sharina Nadura, Sam Alkoff, Tay Maria Studio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Mary Conlon, Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, John Randolph. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe.